I'm Jen Haas, Partnership Manager here at Island Press. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some logistics. This webinar will be a brief presentation by Dr. Karen Hall, and then we will go into a moderated q and I'll be reading your questions aloud uh, to Dr. Hall. You may submit questions at any time during the presentation. To do so, please use the questions box in the GoToWebinar panel, which should be on the right side of your screen. If you have any problems, there's also a chat box where you can contact me. Following the webinar, you'll receive a link to a brief survey. Your feedback is imperative to Island Press and to continue our ability to provide these free webinars. So we please encourage you to fill out that survey. This webinar is being recorded and you can expect to see a recording of the webinar uh, by tomorrow. You can also receive the handouts from the webinar or the, the PDF in the handout section of the GoToWebinar panel. Um, just a little bit about Island Press. Island Press is an environmental nonprofit book publisher. We were founded in 1984, and our mission is to provide the best ideas and information to those seeking to understand and protect the environment. We elevate voices of change, shine a spotlight on crucial issues, and focus attention on sustainable solutions like we're doing here today. We are offering a discount on Dr. Hall's book. If you are interested, you can get 30% off by using the code webinar and going to the link here um, at islandpress.org. I'd now like to uh, introduce you to Dr. Karen Hall. She is a professor of environmental studies at the University of California in Santa Cruz. She's been teaching and advising on ecological restoration for over 20 years, and her experience in the restoration of ecosystems spans the globe. Dr. Hall's new book, Primer for Ecological Restoration, officially publishes next month with Island Press. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Hall. Okay, hopefully, whoops. Um, oh, I can you see my screen okay now, Jen? Yes, perfect. Okay, so hello, guys. I'm Karen Hole, and um, I'm really thank you for being here today. It's very exciting to tell you about my new book and how you might use it in an ecological restoration in a class that you're teaching. I thought I'd start by talking a little bit about how I um, sorry. I thought I would start by telling you about the um, goals of my book and why I originally wrote it. Um, I've taught restoration ecology for, at the time I was writing about over 20 years, now almost 25 years, and I really wanted to provide a broad but succinct overview of the science of restoration, the practice, and also the policy. And a lot has been written in the field of restoration. There's a lot of primary literature, there's books on specific ecosystems, but they tend to have a really focused area, and they also there are also some textbooks available. They tend to be quite long and also quite expensive. And so my goal was to bring this together in as succinct as manner as possible, and to bring together both the science of the ecology behind restoration, but also how you do restoration in practice, and thinking about the policies, which a lot of people don't talk about as much, because they're all key to be able being able to do restoration well. I also aim to try to bring in examples from different regions and ecosystems. Obviously, my own bias comes in. I do a lot of work in California and in the tropics, but I really tried to pick examples from around the globe and was fortunate to have some excellent reviewers of the draft of it who were from different continents who gave me some really good feedback on different examples and where I was a little bit more regionally biased. And so that was one of my big goals. I was also trying to make it really accessible to a general audience, and so to that end, I tried to use as little uh, specialized terminology and to define terms when I use them, so I have a glossary and try to give examples and to put it at a reasonable price. And so a lot of textbooks these days run in the you know, 90, 100, even more dollars, and the list price is 35, and as Jen mentioned, you can get a discount. So. So I wanted to make it something that people, students could easily or individuals could purchase without breaking the bank. So trying to make it accessible. And to do that, it meant that I made certain choices, which was that the, the tables and figures are all in black and white, but then I put a lot of online resources that are in color. And I the book itself is very general, but I intended it to be a guide to other resources. So where would you go next if you went um, if you started with this book. 
And so to that end, I have a pretty extensive uh, literature cited section. There are suggested readings at the end of each chapter, a few to say this is where you might go next. And there's also quite a few online resources. I'll talk about those as I go along in a little bit. The audience for the book that I was aiming for was primarily for restoration ecology or ecological restoration classes. And the idea is that I know that restoration ecology classes are taught in a lot of different ways. Some people focus more on the science, some are short courses for practitioners, and some people focus more on regional ecosystems. But by keeping the book fairly short, it means that people can choose other readings and then tailor the specific content in more detail to how the course is taught. I could also see it being taught as one book in, uh, used as a one book in a class that focused on conservation biology or natural resource management and then combined with other books that deal with other areas of conservation since it is shorter. And I'm hoping that also it'll be of interest to practitioners or other individuals who want an introduction to the field. Today, what I will be focusing on is primarily this question of how you would use it in a restoration ecology or ecological restoration class. And probably a lot of the seminar is about how I teach my class. I realize that different classes have different foci. So I'll talk just a little bit about my class to understand, so you understand my biases and where I'm coming from. Um, I have taught, as I said, for almost 25 years, a restoration ecology class. I'm in an interdisciplinary and environmental studies department, though I'm an ecologist by training. So I do try to teach about not just the science, but also how do you do restoration projects? Because a lot of my students want to go into the field and want to have some of those more tangible knowledge of how to do restoration. And I'm teaching primarily um, juniors and seniors in college, though I think this could be used at you know, other levels, um, potentially, um, since it is fairly general. So that's how I teach, and I'll talk about some examples. So if other people online in the end have other suggestions, I'm always myself learning how, coming up with new ideas. So what I wanted to do was to start by talking about how I laid out the book. And one thing I will say is that um, you don't necessarily have to use the book in this exact order. And I remember it was interesting when the reviewers were reading the chapters, some made suggestions about which order and they, different people had different suggestions. And then one of my reviewers said, you know, it really doesn't matter because you could assign the chapters in different order. And in fact, um, I assigned them a little bit out of order, at least one of them in my own class. Um, but this was sort of the, what to me felt like a logical flow of topics. So, so you might emphasize certain things or use them in different orders. But I think, it, anybody would start out with thinking about why are we going to restore ecosystems. So the first two chapters are fairly brief and we're looking at things like, you know, what different motivators that stakeholders had, understanding, you know, that people have different reasons that they do restoration and people also define restoration very differently. And there's not necessarily a right answer there, but understanding that it's important to think about those definitions in the context of each process project and realizing that people often have conflicting goals of restoration. And so the fact that there's not always a single right answer. And so starting out with really thinking about some of these questions. The next two chapters focus on project planning and um, implementation. And so really going through the process of how you would do a project. And this is obviously a really general overview, but thinking about you know, goal setting objectives, how do you define a reference model, um, you know, how things you need to include in a restoration design plan. And then in the second chapter dealing, um, in chapter four, we're dealing with monitoring and maintenance. And this is where I actually tend to, to go through a bunch of these other chapters and then get to monitoring and maintenance a little bit later with my students so that they know a little bit more about how you do restoration in chapters five through 10 and then talk about monitoring after that. But different people might teach the course differently depending on their audience. Um, I have a fairly long chapter um, talking about applying ecological knowledge to restoration because I do think it's really important to understand the science um, in designing a good restoration project. And so thinking about things about, you know, what do we know about the system and interactions in the system? For example, this is one of the case studies um, uh, with the introduction of the Galapagos giant tortoise and thinking about, okay, how do we know about some of the feedback loops that they've learned through restoration about how the tortoises affect the native woody vegetation? Um, and the cacti, and then how that's affected by some of the feral animals that are like goats and rats, and, and how restoration has to think about, you know, 
not only did we reduce in, introduce the tortoise, but how do we address the feral animals and those types of interactions? And so really understanding the science and the ecology of the system. Uh, I talk a lot about thinking about the ecology at different temporal and spatial scales. So thinking about successional trajectories, spatial scales, thinking about how do we restore in the landscape, you know, do we restore close to you know, certain habitats, proximity to habitats, or maybe we need to think about sort of smaller populations and stepping stone populations or restoring corridors. And so thinking about some of those spatial issues. Now, obviously, I'm not going to be able to address all the ecology in a single chapter, and there are um, some restoration ecology courses that really focus on the ecology. And for that, one of the complementary books that I think is excellent is another book from Island Press, an edited volume by Margaret Palmer and colleagues, where they do they have separate chapters on different topics in ecology and restoration. So that would be a great complement for courses that use really focus more on the ecology. Um, the next section um, is focuses on thinking about abiotic factors and how do we um, you know, restore abiotic factors first, because if we don't get those right, getting the plants and the animals, it, it's extremely challenging. And so focusing on landform and hydrology um, and soil and water quality in both terrestrial and aquatic systems. So for instance, this is one of the drawings here from the book, thinking about how do we restore heterogeneity in arid systems, and so using microcatchments to collect seeds and nutrients and create topographic microheterogeneity. Or in some of the river systems, again, this is another drawing from the book, um, thinking about different habitat, um, microhabitats within rivers, you have riffles and pools and wetlands, and how do you restore flow processes and channel meandering um, in order to be able to restore the habitat and then the fauna in the river. The next series of chapters then move on to um, various biotic um, uh, considerations um, in restoration in most systems. We have to think about these days invasive species, and so thinking about you know, why invasive species are a problem, and then how we control them through either early detection and monitoring or different types of eradication methods. Um, I then talk about revegetation and different ways you might revegetate, um, different issues with using seeds or using plants or just using natural regeneration as approach, and also some of the guidelines for selecting vegetation and genetics and a number of different topics, and then also managing the vegetation once it's established. And the final uh, chapter in that series focuses on fauna and thinking about you know, how do we restore habitat for fauna, but also how we might do um, you know, reintroduction efforts, like the California condor, or um, uh, restoring habitat connectivity um, and you know, tunnels and different underpasses for animals. Um, and so thinking about that um, in the context of both restoring the habitat and also reintroduction efforts. The final two chapters um, focus on policy and legislation and pain for restoration. And I found that these are topics that often aren't addressed in, um, aren't addressed in a lot of restoration ecology books. Uh, at least the textbooks that I've seen, um, most of them don't don't cover that. And any practitioner will tell you that these are absolutely critical questions. And so I have a chapter on legislation which tries to talk about different legislative approaches with examples from different countries um, to try and the implications of that for getting permits when you're doing restoration. And then the final chapter is thinking about how we're gonna pay for restoration um, and thinking about sort of this framework as the figure shows, if you know if you have a responsible party or if you don't have a responsible party, and what might be different sources of funding, and then having different types of different examples to illustrate each of these different types of funding models. So as I said, um, whoops, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> that's the basic outline of the book itself, um, and it is, I, as I said, try to be, keep it pretty succinct. The actual text I have a copy here is about. Um, it's fairly small format, and it's about 150 pages. So um, it does give a chance in classes to to have other readings. Um, the other thing is is that I had um, I talk about some of these different issues of legislation or science in um, different chapters because one has to. What I do is use uh, case studies to try to integrate those 
those topics. And the case studies are referred to in the book in several places where I think they're particularly good examples of certain general concepts. And I tried to pick case studies from around the world. So I used uh, some about restoration of Asian mangroves, the Brazilian Atlantic forest, also some really large scale projects in the US like dam removal on the Elwha River and restoring meandering on the Kissimmee River in Florida, but also focusing on um, uh, one small scale case study near where I work at um, in Santa Cruz which is more focused on um, including students and volunteers in restoration um, and some of the legislative constraints and then um, tamarisk removal which gets at um, some of the issues of removing invasive species and how they can have negative effects on endangered species like the willow flycatcher. Um, all these case studies were co-authored with somebody who works in the system to make sure that um, we got all the stakeholders and all the science right in those systems, but I tried to write them in a similar voice so that they, and then link them in the book, the concepts. I also, as I said, um, because it's shorter, um, it, it, I try to suggest complementary readings. In my own class, I um, use various, um, various primary literature papers, some particularly there's a new um, Society for Ecological Restoration Standards that I think are pretty important for students to have seen, um, some other key papers. And then there's also quite a few other books that um, are available that could be used as complementary um, readings depending on what the focus of the course is. And so for instance, if the course is more hands-on, uh, the Rieger project planning and management for ecological restoration course is a great one, really thinking about how do you do restoration, you know, a pro implement a project. If it, you're focused more on an ecosystem type, then perhaps, you know, if you're working in prairies, then using a very more ecosystem type-based restoration book like the Tall Grass Restoration Handbook. Um, I use one chapter from Creating and Restoring Wetlands, um, another book um, for my students to talk in more detail about wetland restoration because um, that's really a key issue in the United States. Um, and so there's a lot of different additional readings and I try to provide um, some suggestions of those, but of course people will know the literature in their particular region probably better than I do. Um, and then I also ha on the website have links to other resources. Um, in my own class I've started using more videos. I'll often have the students watch videos at home so that they do that on their own time and then we'll talk about them in class. And there's just no substitute for actually seeing um, some of these short videos. I, I can't talk about and do justice to how do you move sediment and wetlands the same way a video does on that, or make the case for why we should be um, investing in coral reef restoration from you know, an economic standpoint. Um, and these are changing all the time, and so I'm gonna try to keep updating those. Um, it, the challenge is finding videos that aren't an hour and a half long to use in teaching, and so I'm always looking for um, good videos, so I completely welcome suggestions from the audience. If you have suggestions for good, particularly short videos, um, it's hard to find them and that are not done with a, a real strong bias sort of a restoration company. So I've been trying, to, I've been trying to put those together. And I also have some. We have all the figures and some additional photos that I use online, and I will continue to expand those, as well as links to other figures that I perhaps don't have copyright access to. But there's a lot of photos on the web that could be used and so trying to make other resources available um, and uh, and also there's a, a lot of photos um, for each of the case studies in color too. Another thing that I use a lot in class and then I have a file online that again I'm continuing to each year iterate I'm actually teaching my class right now and realizing that some of the questions might work better than others and so I'll continue to update it is having the students work in small groups on reflection and discussion and what I do in my own class is that I have the students choose a restoration case study at the beginning of the quarter as a group. So I have groups of three or four students. Um, if one were reading the book on their own, they might already have a case study they know about that they're focused on. Um, and if one doesn't have a case study, I really recommend using local case studies, but the Society for Ecological Restoration, SIR, also has a, a database that one could use. And so I have some general questions for reflection and discussion, but a lot of them ask, I ask my, or ask the reader or I ask my students to think about some of these general concepts and really apply it to a specific case study so that then they can think through the nuts and bolts of what they're learning. So that would be some types of questions that I use are things like, 
know, make a list of all the stakeholders you can think of, their primary goals for the project, and any concerns about the project that they might have. To think about you know, what differences are, how might you resolve those differences? What type of disturbance has the ecosystem evolved with, and what strategies could be employed to simulate that disturbance to restore the ecosystem? And so, you know, if they're working in a fire-dependent ecosystem, you know, how is the ecosystem adapted, and, and how do you incorporate that into restoration? Um, for a project that includes revegetation, what plant characteristics would be given the highest priority in selecting species, depending on both the social and ecological goals? You know, where would you collect the seeds from? And those are things I talk about generally in the book is, you know, what decisions do you make and where you collect seeds from? But really applying that to a given project makes it much more concrete for the students. Um, another one that I have them do is, you know, make a list of the laws that affect the restoration that's done in your system and the permits needed to implement the restoration project. So that really helps ground the um, uh, questions or the general concepts in the book. So, um, and again, I will continue to update these and I always welcome uh, suggestions and feedback if some are not useful, more useful. And like I said, I'm even finding myself as I'm teaching that some, some questions need to be revised. A few other active learning suggestions um, for restoration, teaching restoration ecology classes that I use that I think complement the book well. Uh, we've already talked about small group discussion of questions. Um, I have, um, an exercise that I have my students do is to review a restoration design plan. And I have put on the website, I've gotten permission from practitioners that I know and have about six to eight restoration design plans on the website. They are um, primarily from the Western US, which is, <laughs> reflects people that I know. I would love to have some from other areas that people would like to volunteer to have theirs um, available to students and for people to review. And then I ask my students to you know, look at the plan and think about what I've talked about in the book and what they think is strong about that plan, what they might do differently. And for them, it's really illustrative to see you know, what does a real restoration plan look like and what's involved. Um, uh, the other thing that I have them do is um, I, I happen to work on a campus with a fair amount of space. And so we I talk to the land management folks on my campus and we find each year a place where they are doing some restoration or management. And I have my students go out and write a small plan themselves for restoration. It's, it's not very long, but towards the end of the quarter, having them actually go out and pick a restoration site and then have them come up with a plan allows them to, um, to apply the knowledge. And I always try to pick one that is a real plan, is a real project, not something that I've invented just as a class exercise. Another thing that I do that they, um, uh, everybody really likes is doing a debate. And so we try to pick some restoration where options, like I usually try to pick three options. For instance, this year, my students debated how to restore Brazilian Atlantic forest. Should you use natural regeneration, plant a mix of native and non-native species or plant native species? And the idea with that is to have them realize that there's not a right answer and that there are pros and cons depending on what the stakeholders want and you know what the goal of the project is. And um, the students always really enjoy that and it, it's very educational to them to see different, the debates that happen in public settings. And then I strongly recommend, um, and that's probably most faculty use these, some sort of guest speakers or field trips to go from the general to the specific. And I've found that many practitioners are actually really happy to come in and talk to students because they, they like to come talk about their projects. And so I strongly recommend trying to bring in guest speakers or get students out into the field to, again, to go from the general, which is what my book tries to do, and then try to get specific examples um, that really are regionally meaningful for whoever is reading the book or student classes. So that's mostly what I wanted to say, but I realize that I may not have addressed a lot of questions that you know people have other ideas or suggestions. So um, I guess I'll say that you can purchase a paperback or ebook from Island Press. Um, you can also get it at other booksellers, but if you do it Island Press, then you actually get a 20% discount. As I noted, um, I will continue to try to keep the materials up to date as I teach and, and come across more materials. And I really appreciate suggestions of restoration plans or videos um, or questions that you use in your class. I hope this um, the website can be a resource. And with that, I will um, open it up to questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Um, great presentation. So um, 
again, if you'd like to ask your questions, you can do so uh, with the questions bar on the side. Um, I've got a few uh, ones to get started for us. So um, could you just tell us a little about what lessons you have learned in using the book in your own coursework, Dr. Hull? Um, well, I, since I uh, since I wrote the book, having taught for 20 years, it definitely has evolved over time. And um, I what I did was actually last year, I had the students read a draft of the book and then they gave me feedback. And so I definitely was helpful for me in understanding some terminology that might have been complicated that they didn't quite understand. I also um, have found too that it, just like I said, it's fairly general, and I think that for students really trying to do what you can through, through the case studies online and other case studies locally is trying to engage them in conversations, but more concrete conversations about specific case studies that then they can work through some of those ideas. And so that's really what I'm trying to do in the process of. Um, uh, you know, was trying to do with this book was to keep it short, but then to let to use those general concepts and, and give guidance on how to apply them. Right, that's great. Um, we have a question from the audience. So, um, are there any suggestions for online courses? Um, this professor is revamping their online course uh, in masters for ecological restoration and looking for some new ideas. Um. That's a good question. Um, the ones that I know about, and this is maybe my bias because I am, um, I work in the tropics. There's a couple of organizations that do, um, one is LT, that's E-L-T-I. Um, they're based at Yale University at the Environmental Leadership and Training Institute. And they do some online um, tropical forest restoration online courses, and that's largely geared to um, people in tropical countries who might not have access to courses. And so they've got some videos and um, and I don't know how their enrollment works, but I know that they've had, like I've taped webinars for them before and then done things like that. Um, I am not, those are, the, so, so most of the um, courses that I'm familiar with have been focused more on training people in, like the, in developing countries where they might not have access to courses. I do not know of any specifically in the United States um, of online courses, though I have never honestly really looked for them because I teach my own course. Um, but it's, yeah, that's, a, that's a good question. Think about that one. Yeah. Um, well, if the you other think thing is actually, well, I mean, uh, the other thing is I would say that Sir, I'll put a little plug in here, does um, a bunch of webinars and um, have and they have a really good webinar series and so I actually use some of those webinars um, I've used some of them in the class you have to be a SIR member or have a, um, a student chapter to use their webinars but I found those to be really helpful and they get they give practitioner they have a certification program and a practitioner a sort of practitioner certification program and they give like one unit of credit for these different webinars and so it's not a full course but that's another resource of that um, could be used to provide additional online materials. And there's, um, if you become a member of the Society for Ecological Restoration, which is a great thing to do anyways, you have access to all their historical webinars and they put one out about once, at least one a month. And so that's another good resource. And um, as I said, if you start a student chapter of it at your university, then they will let you use them for classes also. Great, I will make sure there's a link to Sir in the follow-up email for those who are interested in more information there. Yeah, um, and Sir was also, this is part of, um, Sir was also a co-sponsor of my book and they've worked with Island Press quite a bit on publication of, restora of the restoration series. So I would like to put in a plug for them. Yeah, we have, I believe, over 30 books um, that we've published with them. So very strong history. Um, so another question, um, how has education in ecological restoration changed over the years and do you have any trends that you'd predict for the future? Um, mostly I'd say the big trend for the future is that it is continuing to grow. Um, it's been amazing to me, um, um, now I will date myself, but I remember you know, going to like the ecological society meeting when I was a graduate student and there was like there wasn't even a session on ecological restoration. And now when I go to those meetings, there's you know, 
20 of them. And so you look at all the classes that are being offered, and so it just is continuing to grow. There's more and more short courses that are available um, and specialized programs. There's a number of uh, universities now that have masters and, in programs, and so I think it's going to continue to grow. Um, the field of restoration, there's a lot more debate these days with global change of going from thinking just about restoring um, pre-disturbance condition to now thinking about you know, how are we going to restore resilience in a changing climate and um, just the scale of restoration is, is pretty um, phenomenal now of what people are proposing. And I, I would say just the way it's been integrated, you know, that people are thinking more, you know, even, you know, our legislators are thinking about, you know, what, what role does restoration play? And so um, I think that that's, there's, um, and I've even heard about, you know, restoration courses or, you know, at the high school level. And so there's just a lot more available um, in different settings. Um, I'm trying to think what else. And like I said, it really depends where you are, whether they're more in class or more short courses in the field um, and what's available. Great. Um, are there other questions from online people? Any suggestions? Yeah, we do have one that just came in. Um, do you know of programs getting started in the UN? Be, uh, as the U, I'm sorry, do you know of programs getting started as the UN begins the decade of ecosystem restoration? That's a good question, and I am not up to date on the latest of that. I've been mostly personally um, focused on um, some of the work that they're doing. Um, people have probably heard in the news that there's a lot of proposals now to do um, a lot of tree planting, and that's from the business community and the policy community, and the UN has some too. And my own concern um, or where I'm trying to be involved is thinking about how we do that thoughtfully because um, I feel strongly that tree planting can be a very helpful thing to re re ecosystem recovery, but um, it's not a panacea. It's not us. It, it is one of many ways to restore forests, and we need to be clear, you know, what our goals for restoring forests are, and we need to do tree planting thoughtfully and not just go out and put them in the ground, but think about what species we're putting in the ground and how we're going to maintain them for the long term. So I have a lot of thoughts about that one. And so I've mostly been working with people right now, um, some um, NGOs, and also um, trying to <laughs> maybe start working on some guidelines and how we would actually think about how to do some of this um, forest restoration better. Um, and I was not personally, at, I know there was a lot of conversation at the last SIR conference um, Early, about a year, it's about six months ago now. I wasn't there, but I, I don't know of any. So that, uh, I shouldn't say, I don't, beyond that, I don't know of other programs that are going on at this point. I think it's more um, at a regional scale. <coughs> me. Yep. Great. Um, any final questions from our audience? Oh, oh here we go. Um, what are some of the considerations for ecological restoration conservation within the context of urban planning and land use, working in the context of scenario planning? Any thoughts there? I am not, I try to be honest about what I do and don't know. I don't do a lot of urban restoration planning. I think that urban, re, sorry, I don't do a lot of urban restoration. Um, and um, I'm sorry, could you actually repeat the whole question again? I apologize. Sure. Um, Jotting down a note when you ask me that. Yeah, of course. Um, what are some of the considerations for ecological restoration slash conservation within the context of urban planning and land use, working in the context of scenario planning? Okay. So I'm going to focus my focus on urban restoration because I don't know um, as much about specific urban scenario planning. Um, I think there's a lot of um, a lot of opportunity for restoration in urban areas, and I one of the things about working in urban areas that one has to think about is, and this is just a general thing in restoration, is to think about what your goals are. In a lot of urban restoration projects, they're extremely constrained. And so thinking about, you know, I think about in the city of Santa Cruz where I live, and there's a ri river, the San Lorenzo River, and as I tell my students, there's only certain things that you can do in restoring that river. Now, you can certainly increase flow into the river. You can restore the habitat a little bit, but because the city is actually built in the river floodplain, um, we won't ever be completely taking down the levees and restoring a meandering river. 
and there's also concerns about flood conveyance and water conveyance through that river so that requires them to keep the channel mouth open and sometimes disturb the habitat and so in urban restoration i think there's a huge opportunity to get people involved and there's been some really good examples of urban restoration projects of the importance of using them for education for getting people involved in you know greening their cities um, from an ecological perspective those goals um, the ecological goals always have to be somewhat constrained by what we can do with the people living there and so um, there's always that balance there and I'm not saying that you know so I think urban restoration products are really valuable but we have to be realistic about what we can achieve and I think the biggest the biggest role that a lot of urban restoration have to play is providing um, opportunities for people for green spaces and to connect with nature in those areas and another good example is the Presidio in San Francisco where they've done a lot of restoration and brought um, underserved youth out and really engaged people in those and, and there's some really good examples and um, the, one of the SIR series I didn't put this book up there the restoring streams and cities um, is another book that Island Press has published that really focuses very much on urban restoration, particularly with respect to streams. And so that might be another good one to look at um, to get more information on that topic. Great. Thank you. That's a great resource. Um, excellent. Any uh, final questions from our audience? Okay. Nothing's popping up. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Hall, I appreciate you and your time um, in doing this presentation. Again, folks, if you can please fill out the survey upon your exit, and I will send an email with the recording and some additional resources um, to everyone after this. So thank you very much, and everyone have a great rest of your day.